back in action and well the nfl's back in action with the preseason already begun and training camp well pretty much almost wrapping up mm -hmm. you've got injuries from around the league that are coming through and we need to talk about them and the impact on your fantasy teams it's the audible see salami sigma bloom and well we're waiting and we're wondering how serious is it cards coming out for everybody first yeah. off boom. let's just say that whether it's uh, lucas kroll or whatever in the preseason like the cards coming out for everybody and then people figure out like oh wait it's not that serious so what's up with jameer gibbs because was uh, you know like that's that's a situation where fantasy gyms are pretty nervous we're a nervous type yeah uh they say he dodged an arrow i think that's one of the headlines on our newswire and uh what dan campbell's like ah, i should be fine right of course that's old school dan campbell but what's your feel here on the gibbs situation which certainly sent some shock waves around fantasy communities yeah we can't treat this as a non-event i don't think sure. we can say oh this is nothing he says he'll be ready for week one dan campbell said that so it's nothing uh jameer gibbs was in a tier with saquon barkley and jonathan taylor maybe you were taking them in the late first maybe in the early second i know which one sounds better for gibbs now so that's maybe for gibbs he did have a hamstring injury last year and really is there that much difference between jameer gibbs and devin achan when we're looking at their outlook for this year incredibly efficient per touch should be more involved in the passing game explosive players can take any touch to the house and in incredibly efficient offenses we just need them to stay on the field that's it uh and we could see these guys both of them approach like early career alvin Kamara kind of numbers with more big play spikes so they're both good second round picks now jameer gibbs in the first round doesn't seem as attractive because the injury seal has been broken and the reality is if the rest does him well and he's practicing in full leading into the matthew stafford revenge game to open the season then maybe we just put this all behind us and if you took gibbs even in the late first round you're going to feel good about that but here's the problem we don't get to look ahead to week one injury reports when we're drafting in august so you have to take a little bit of that leap of faith and i think that means Maybe you take the player you like most other than Jameer Gibbs if you drew pick 10, 11, 12, and then hope that Gibbs is there on the turn. And if not, again, Devin Achan is a pretty good substitute. Yeah, Achan's a good substitute, Bloom. Unless you're using retro causality, yeah. uh, you can use the future. Sure. the future is influencing you right it now. Is. With Gibbs, it's like, okay, and we, we can see how they'll look different. Mm -hmm. which is a good way to collect information because it's like, okay, when this major piece of the offense is out and we'll get to others, but on Detroit sure. specifically, we get to see, oh, that's what they're going to look like without. Right. Him. Right. And that's David Montgomery, a lot of a David lot. Montgomery. A so lot. when we, yeah, when we saw Gibbs miss time last year, David Montgomery becomes basically a first round draft pick for fantasy football, a first, second round draft pick. Uh, you know, if Gibbs were to go down for the season, Montgomery would move up to at the very least, the, the Derrick Henry, Isaiah Pacheco range, okay, mm -hmm. uh, Kyron Williams, like third round, maybe creeping into the second round. So I think if anything, the real fantasy headline from the Jameer Gibbs injury is Dave Montgomery is undervalued. Yes, Dave Montgomery undervalued, and that leads us to San Francisco with the calf injury to Chris McCaffrey and might have a player behind him undervalued, right. although McCaffrey's been resting, been feeling well, saying that he'll be ready for the start of the regular season. And this is another great glass half full, glass half empty because Christian McCaffrey made it through last season. And if you were taking him third, fourth, fifth, you got, you got that injury discount instead of number one because of his injury history, then you profited. He had a calf injury. I think it was going into the bye, right? It was the week before the bye last year. And there was a lot of talk like, I mean, they should just rest him, right? I mean, you want him to rest him. If you have McCaffrey, you want them to rest him. You don't want this. Calf injuries can be tricky. They can be aggravated. Ask Joe Burrow. But they played him, and it was a non-event. That was actually, in hindsight, a non-event. So you could say, yeah, calf injuries, minor calf injury, non-event. However, if, if this starts to become a pattern with McCaffrey, we're paying a lot closer attention to who is behind McCaffrey. I think, again, that's the headline here. And do you take McCaffrey out of the number one spot? If you were going to take a number one, I'd probably take him number one anyway. CeeDee Lamb's going to sign. That's a whole other thing. But 
I think that it's okay. I mean, if you want to take Tyreek Hill over Christian McCaffrey, I'm not going to talk you out of that. But what everybody needs to know is who's behind Christian McCaffrey. Eliza Mitchell, heard this one before, hurt, hamstring. Isaiah Garendo, have you heard this one before? Kyle Shanahan really wanted a running back in the third or fourth round. <laughs> uh, he's hurt. Okay. Yeah. May even be a red shirt year for him. It's Jordan Mason. And multiple beat writers have said Mason is having a good enough camp that he may just overtake Elijah Mitchell. But Elijah Mitchell is already hurt anyway. So I think that Jordan Mason is a player. I will say this. If you do take Christian McCaffrey, number one, number two, you better take Jordan Mason. And if you don't take McCaffrey, I think Jordan Mason is still a very good pick because we may see as early as week one, McCaffrey, first of all, if McCaffrey's still limited in practices going into week one, okay, this isn't just a minor calf injury. If he aggravates the calf injury in week one, now you're looking at Jordan Mason. Again, see, if Christian McCaffrey were to go down, perish the thought. Jordan Mason becomes, assuming he is the backup, and I think what we saw in the preseason also, he is really growing as a player. And they were reluctant to use him as more than a special teams player in the past. I think that has changed changed so i'm looking at jordan mason it's like a 12th 13th 14th round pick a priority pick because the injury seal has already been broken in the starter ahead of him and he's in a really really good running game yeah the offense is humming you can step right in and you can produce and then there's offenses we don't even get to see like the jj mccarthy thing it was no sooner uh, that i finished tuesday's show about the rookie quarterbacks and their performances that the news came out J.J. McCarthy with the meniscus. They choose the surgery that's best for his long-term career, which I think is best. Uh, in fact, on that day, before we knew he was shut down for the year, I told Andrew Mason, I said, shut him down. Shut him down. Like, uh, you got Sam Darnold, whatever. It's a weird transition year anyway. post Kirk Cousins era. It's not going real great for Minnesota. So now we know J.J. McCarthy's going to miss the year. Yeah. And it could be consequential for the arc of his career probably not but even if he wasn't going to play this year or wasn't going to need a time just just that development is important uh that being said I, i'm not going to downgrade him greatly in dynasty and superflex dynasty i think you're crazy if you trade him now in superflex dynasty go ahead and throw out a buy low offer if you want uh, but this puts all the focus back on sam darnold and since you've been bringing up sam darnold for a long time as a quarterback that some around the league, Kyle Shanahan, think is a lot better than what we saw in Carolina and what we saw with the Jets. And we didn't get to see enough of him with San Francisco to know whether Kyle Shanahan was right. But we do know that he is going into an, a terrific structure around him with Minnesota. This has been certainly for fantasy football. What we saw last year with Joshua Dobbs, and Nick Mullins. This is a productive pass offense so for fantasy now sam darnold has a lot more appeal in super flex leagues maybe even in deeper leagues 14 16 team leagues as a quarterback too and certainly somebody we could be talking about very early on in the season as a waiver wire pick because of how productive this offense has been and because he's going to have that structure around him he starts with giants san francisco uh, Houston Texans, that's one to circle in week three, maybe week four. We're talking about Sam Darnold as a potential breakout player. The name Baker Mayfield comes up a lot, Cease, as a player that can revive his career, rehabilitate his image around the league. So he's got a big opportunity here, and they do still have Nick Mullins. So there are a lot of teams, their backup quarterback isn't as good as Nick Mullins, and that's not a compliment for Nick Mullins. I thought Nick Mullins was going to be a trade target at cutdowns because a lot of teams would see him as an upgrade for their backup quarterback. Now, sure. not so much. Now they need Nick Mullins, but this is a big moment in the career of Sam Darnold. And I don't think it's something, honestly, sees. I don't think it's a problem. If anything, this is a positive for Justin Jefferson. If you're looking at Justin Jefferson, fourth, fifth pick, is he quarterback proof? Well, I would rather have Justin Jefferson with a year of Sam Darnold than with a part year of Sam Darnold and then J.J. McCarthy learning the ropes. Yeah, and I like J.J. McCarthy. I had a second round grade on him. I just think it's a weird fit. With Kevin O'Connell, Sam Darnold fits. Yeah, Sam Darnold really fits. Um, when you know, in that Shanahan offense, like yes, of course he fits. McCarthy just needed time, and then we'll see. 
you know, um, but I think, uh, you know, Minnesota and Darnold himself, I mean, you're set to make a lot of money. Yes. A lot yeah. of money in the system that fits you and that people continually believe. Like Sam Darnold has a way better reputation among coaches than he does right. among all of us chuckleheads. Yeah. And again, I think the key is the glass half full take on him is look at what was around him with the Jets. Look at the organizations, the Panthers right. that gave him opportunities. And once he was in a once he's in a stable organization and good structure around him, we will see the best he can do. And that might be good enough to be a starter in the future. Yeah. And if you want a quarterback at the trade deadline or at the, the uh, end of camp. Right. Sam Bradford style. Jared Stidham. <laughs> yeah. It's a Bronco show. It's a chief show with a word that I get to pronounce, Bloom. So don't make fun of me. Mm -hmm. Sternoclavicular. Yeah. I get that right. Uh, Kansas City Chiefs, Marquise Brown with a chest injury. I'll say it with your chest. Yeah. Uh, Going to miss about a month. Uh, this is not what you wanted when we're excited about Hollywood and Kansas City. And if that's not an oxymoron, I don't know what right. is. But uh, now we got to wait. I'm on. Right, right. The red don't roll out the red carpet uh, for the season opener for Marquise Brown. I think yeah. that's one of the takeaways here. Sternoclavicular, your sternum. See, YouTube, you're getting some visuals here. And your clavicle, your collarbone. So I think this is like cartilage. We've seen this kind of injury before. It's cartilage in between the sternum and the clavicle. And I, I think it's just dangerous to play until that's healed. And then you're talking about the structural integrity of a player's chest area. And we don't want that. That's why rib injuries, sometimes broken ribs can be something that takes longer if there's a danger of that fracture causing organ damage and things like that. So sometime in September, that's what we're hearing with Brown sometime in September. And with an injury like this, uh, there's a wide range of how it goes. It can be two weeks, it can be four weeks, it can be nine weeks, depending on the healing. But it's one of those injuries that you don't argue with the body when it's healed. That's when he can play. So I think it opens up this big opportunity for Xavier Worthy. It opens up a big opportunity for Roshi Rice. It looks like Rice, if he's suspended, it won't be until very late in the season, probably most likely in 2025. So I think you're seeing both of these guys move up. You're seeing Marquise Brown move down. It's better than if this was a ligament injury or a soft tissue injury. I think those have a lot more possibility of recurring or having an aggravation. Brown is a speed receiver. We'll see how much Brown drops. Honestly, he was underrated as a fifth round pick. So if he falls to the sixth round, uh, a marginal drop, uh, he still might be a good pick even with this uncertainty. But you're not going to be able to count on him. Uh, you're not going to be able to see what this more vertical, aggressive Chiefs passing game can look like. He's going to miss his revenge game probably against Baltimore. But it creates opportunity for some of the other receivers there. Although if you're asking who's going to take his snaps, Justin Watson. So not opportunity for the player behind Marquise Brown, but certainly the other guys on the field. I think it's an opportunity for Jared Wiley. <laughs> yeah. Because you go two tight end set and hey, we're going to keep it close and nope, go over the top. Uh, as we wrap up today's program, we actually have a two for you, a two piece, because um, Nick Chubb is amazing and I just hope he's healthy. We'll get to Joe Mixon here in, in a little bit. And by the way, a trade that I think Houston needs to execute. We'll see if that happens. But let's talk about Nick Chubb and how fantasy GM should feel here in the very middle of August. Yeah, I think you should be optimistic. Uh, ninth, 10th round pick should get Nick Chubb on your team, maybe even 11th, 12th round pick. And here's what we know. He was working out a few weeks ago on a side field doing agility drills, doing straight line sprinting with team officials watching him. Some of it was filmed. The owner was looking on. Now, Mary Kay Cabot, who's been covering the Browns for a long time, she thinks it's possible, or at least a week ago, she said it was possible that he could be activated during camp. Zach Jackson, who's also been covering the team for a while, I think he's athletic, says he's, his guess, guess is that he'll start the year on the PUP. But we know because of Joe Bryant, our fearless leader, the mayor of football guys, we love him and he loves us, that value-based drafting shows us that even if we get half a season of Nick Chubb as the starter, remember, this is a team with a good offensive line. This is a team with a good defense. This is a team that wants to run first at its identity with Nick Chubb. That half a season as an, of Nick Chubb the starter is 
yeah, that's going to blow away 10th round value. Now you're going to need to know some things like, do you have an IR slot? That makes it a, a layup because then yeah. these, and this is the same calculus for TJ Hawkinson. IR slot makes it a layup. It's not even going to hamper your chances to get. So it's a win-win, right? Uh, if you have an IR slot and they start the season on the PUP, then it d- doesn't even hamper your waiver wire runs. And if they don't start the season on the PUP, well, their ADP assumes that it's going to. Their ADP assumes we're not going to get anything useful out of these guys until week six, seven, eight. So it's a win-win. And I just think Nick Chubb is the kind of player. He's already come back from a catastrophic knee injury. He's already gotten all the way back to top form. And he is a player sees, you know, he glows. You know, he has an aura that very few players have. You know, sees there are very few players in the NFL, we could say, would fit in any era of the NFL, right? You can put Nick Chubb in any era of the NFL. Yes, yes. He's that kind of guy. So I like in fantasy football, getting back to the genesis of fantasy football of, these are my guys. I'm going to live or die. I'm going to put together a team of the guys I want on my team. And even with a bum knee, I want Nick Chubb on my team. And if you're listening to me and saying, okay, there's Bloom with Narrative Street and all of his flowers and unicorns, well, then go get Jerome Ford. So you, you you should have confidence one way or the other. You should be going into your draft, making a B line in the 10th round for A, Browns running back. It's up to you which one. Both also fine. And while we're on it, Jameis Winston is a national treasure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, he's, you know, I, I think that one of the things people don't understand is we talk a lot about teams as a family. Mm-hmm. And his, Jameis Winston's family love him. and He loves his family. And he's... Mm-hmm. He is a player in the locker room that uh, guys are going to rally behind. Guys are going to have confidence in. And he, from a football culture, football character point of view, Jameis Winston is what a lot of coaches and a lot of teammates want. Well, and it gives you confidence in the offense, right? Something happens with Deshaun Watson, you're fine. Yeah. You're fine. Totally fine. Uh, the Houston Texans are in a Super Bowl window, which is exciting and cool. Exciting and new and well, uh, Joe Mixon is he's going to have a big role. How many times have we said it this offseason? That's fine. Is he going to be ready for said role? And then behind him, I've got an idea, Sigmund. Yeah. How about you bring the band back together with Samaj P. Ryan, who's probably mm-hmm. not going to make the squad in Denver and get pushed out due to Audrey Estime and Javante Williams looking good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Houston, throw a seventh rounder at Denver, get some Ajay P. Ryan because that'll give you better options than what they have now behind Joe Mixon. So our, our talk today is like, okay, here's their injury updates and then kind of what's behind them. You know, yeah. what's the offense look like? Right. Pretty confident in Houston's offense. Would be really cool if Joe Mixon can make it through. And I think it'd be kind of cool to throw in a piece like P. Ryan behind him. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think that that move could tell us a little bit what they think about Mixon, a little bit what they think about Damian Pierce. Mm-hmm. But with Joe Mixon, about a fifth round pick, it was I think it was hamstring reported at first, but then quadricep, uh, high amount of caution here. But the good news is he is back at practice. So what would have made it much more difficult to feel confident about Mixon is if they just said, nope, he's not going to practice. Nope, he's not going to play in the preseason. But we're confident he'll be ready for week one. I guess one of the things we should take a step back and talk about is teams don't have any uh, motivation to tell the truth about injuries in camp at all. There's no rules. There's nothing that says they have to tell the truth about injuries. And every year, some injury that was minor ends up keeping a player sideline for week one and beyond. And every year players go into practice in week one, seemingly healthy. And then we find out, no, they're not actually healthy. Like we didn't even hear about a minor injury. We didn't even see signs that there were problems. So you got to keep your head on a swivel for this stuff. Damian Pierce has gotten positive reviews in camp. He got positive reviews in camp last year. We saw how that turned out. So sure. I think you're, you're right. Cease to bring up P Ryan or any potential veteran running back, uh, especially if they're looking at Mixon already at this point in his career, opening of the injury seal, this should be an offense that produces numbers for the running back just by showing up touchdowns, light boxes. This is a Texans offense. That's going to be very difficult to defend. And the run is not going to be the top priority. So we have to pay close attention to this. And for now it's going in a positive direction for Mixon. But as you indicate, Cease, change could also be coming. The Texans and CJ Stroud can wake up and piss excellence. Sorry, (laughs) Joe. That is a wrap for today's program. It is the Audible Cecil Lammy Sigmund Bloom. 
And we certainly appreciate you for doing a few things. First, check out footballguys.com. If you want to support the show, we don't do any silly super chats. So please go to footballguys.com. Subscribe. You're going to get tens of thousands of pages of information for you to dominate your fantasy football league. It's one place, footballguys.com. And uh, we appreciate you for doing that. Make sure to help us out on YouTube. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Hit the notification bell so that you never miss a vid. We appreciate you for that. He's Sigmund Bloom. Follow him on Twitter X at Sigmund Bloom. I'm at C Salami. The show's at the Audible. And oh yeah, watch these videos. These videos, where are they at? Watch the videos. All up in the videos. Want the other left. Like that. Yes, that one. He's Sig. I'm Cease. We are the Audible. Thanks. Stay tuned. Stay frosty. Thank you.